Hi, everyone. So we are um, looking at part two today, just to put some context on this. All of this is prepared and recorded within um, or for a LinkedIn group called Femme Spectral for women in mining and geology to learn about hyperspectral um, geology and hyperspectral um, imaging and some standard spectroscopy um, background, just as a quick intro, but I'm sharing it on YouTube with everyone. Um, the slide decks can be made available as well. They're available on LinkedIn, so if you're interested, um, go to the Femme Spectral um, group and join that one. Um, it's supposed to be a community for women that work in that field or want to learn within that field and yeah, to, to have some closer group to just chat about things. So today is part two. Uh, we're talking about imaging systems and spectroscopy. I just prepared a couple of slides and we're going to talk through them. Those slides are meant to be comprehensive on its own or on their own. So they are a little bit more um, dense than what you would expect from a different presentation. Um, yeah, let's look at the basics of spectroscopy terms. So um, there's a couple of different terms in the field of imaging spectroscopy that you should be familiar with. And I've written them out here. Uh, in general, imaging spectrometers produce a 3D cube um, representing uh, reality, so 4D, uh, including the spectral space. Um, yeah, but in this case, 3D with two spatial dimensions and the third dimension in the spectral range, and each position in the array of the image, so each pixel represents a continuous spectrum detected by the sensor on that specific um, position. And I'm citing Clark from 1999 here. Um, all of the cit citations that you can find here or most of them are in the first part of this slide deck and of this presentation, um, including some publications that I recommend for you to read. So go back to that one um, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, yeah, so common terms. Um, spectral range describes the region of wavelengths in which the sensor is able to collect data. Spectral bandwidth is the region of wavelengths of each individual channel in the spectrometer. Um, in hyperspectral imaging, we want narrow absorption features to be detected, so we need a narrow spectral bandwidth uh, with channels that are spaced continuously and adjacent to each other. So theoretically, each channel collects only the light from a desired narrow wavelength range and rejects the rest. In reality, that's not the case. The light from outside of the band pass or from the spectral bandwidth may enter the channel because of scattering in the optical system or scattering from the surface. So. Um, but theoretically, each channel represents a very specific wavelength um, area. And the width of this band pass is defined as the full width at half max, um, FWHM, which we, you read quite often in publications and you will come across, um, and that's the spectral response of a spectrometer channel to the monochromatic light. Um, just realized that my video is in the... Okay, let's continue with SNR. Um, I hope not too much will be cut off by my head in the right bottom corner. Um, but yeah, so signal to noise ratio is crucial and a metric that is sometimes hard to explain. In general, what we're interested in is the measure um, of the strength of the useful signal compared to the level of background noise or noise present in the data. A higher SNR indicates a strong, more reliable signal relative to the noise, and that corresponds to better image quality and more accurate spectral information. There's a lot of different factors that can influence the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, and there's not usually one matrix that can be supplied. So if someone is supplying uh, an SNR for, yeah, a very specific SNR for the instrument, please be aware that that's potentially for the highest possible quality of data that they can collect. But signal-to-noise ratio can be influenced by different sensor characteristics, so sensitivity, spectral range, dynamic range, noise performance of the detector itself, by different acquisition parameters, like the integration time, the exposure setting, the spatial resolution um, of your, the camera. So depending on how many pixels you actually try to um, split the incoming light up into on the detector, that will probably increase the noise within the signal that is being collected or it's not increasing, but it's increasing that, it's changing that um, dynamic between the two different factors. Um, and then environmental conditions like ambient light, atmospheric effects, and like scene complexity, and then data processing can affect it too. Signature to noise is uh, affected by a lot of different factors. And I just, for now, want you to be aware of that.
between the two is here. So multispectral uh, imaging collects the incoming signal in a smaller number of bands. And you can see that here in the, um, let's see if you can see my pointer. Yeah, so you can see that here that for a Sentinel-2 Copernicus satellite, um, multispectral satellite collects, um, I think, nine different bands in the visible to near infrared up to 1000. Then we have the gaps in the collection here, which is um, due to the atmospheric windows um, being in other regions. And then we have a couple of channels in the short wave infrared between 1000 and 2500 nanometers. Whereas hyperspectral is trying to collect all of this information in continuous, narrow, consecutive, overlapping wavelengths. Um, and I think the there's a standard for hyperspectral. Um, yeah, that's coming in the next slide. But um, in general, yeah, those are the two main terms. And then sometimes people refer to superspectral as something between multi and hyperspectral. I usually refer to it when it's between 15 and 32 bands or 33 bands or something like that. So World U3 commercial satellite would fall under that category. But it's more of a loose. Um, yeah, so. Just as an intro to what the hyperspectral um, spectrum looks like compared to multispectral or superspectral. Um, so in the blue spectrum, we can see that here we have um, these very narrow features that can be resolved. Whereas in um, Worldview, which is really close to the Aster satellite as well, we see some information hap or something happening affecting the end of the spectrum here. And we see the big iron features, but we don't really see enough detail. And then for Sentinel-2, we, we only get the information from the linear here. So we only get the uh, information that might give us an indication for iron um, content, not necessarily quantity. There is a standard for hyperspectral, um, yeah, for hyperspectral terminology. So the IEEE Standard Association set up a standard in 2018 that covers the wavelengths range between 250 to 2500 nanometers. And they consider that if it exceeds 32 bands, it's, it's hyperspectral. So there is a definition for that. As I said, the superspectral is more of a, um, it's more of a loose terminology there. Um, yeah, so most hyperspectral instruments, especially in the short wave infrared, collect in push broom architecture. So um, that that's comes from the um, background of satellite imagery as well. So either the camera has to move over an image to collect line by line and make up a whole image, or um, the, the sample or whatever is moving under the camera. So in the case of conveyor belts, um, that would be the case. And that's how it makes up this whole image line by line. And then we get the spectral information um, for each, within each um, yeah, wavelength um, that is being recorded or bent pass. Um, we have a couple of different platforms. Um, I think you are probably familiar with most of them, just um, sorted by spatial resolution from lab to the field when you mount it on a tripod to the um, UAS to an aircraft and satellite. So we have different airborne systems and the um, uncrewed aerial systems and aircrafts themselves. Um, and we have quite a big divide in pixel size here. So UAS is three, sometimes six to um, usually 15 centimeters, depends on how high you're flying. Usually um, within European law and um, national international law right now, you're not allowed to fly higher than 120 meters without specific permission. So people usually stay under 120 meters um, flight height compared to the above ground level. Um, so we usually end up somewhere between six to um, 15 centimeter pixels. If you fly closer, we can go a lot lower in the um, pixel size here, get a higher spatial resolution. For aircrafts, we're somewhere between uh, two and five meters, sometimes nine. Um, and for satellites, um, we have some really high performing satellites that collect more in the multispectral um, range that go up to one meter in the visible to near infrared. Um, but we also have a very typical hyperspectral visible to near and short wave infrared would be around 20 to 30 meter pixels. Spectral resolution changes that depends on the instrument, it depends on the size of the um, optical system that is available or that the payload can actually um, allow and the lenses and, and all of that. So it's hard to get a very clear um, picture on that for each platform. but. 
at least there's like some ballpark numbers here um, and the satellites tend to have wider um, band paths and wider spectral channels so we have a lower spectral resolution and then the temporal visit time um, i mean satellites now we have weekly or daily aircraft and uas just depends on how often you can fly and you have atmospheric conditions that are favorable and the same goes for the tripod in the field um, and in the lab you can scan as often as you want obviously because you have control conditions uh, and illumination um yeah so i'm i'm just going to name a couple of different platforms and instruments that you will likely be in contact with one or the other uh, when you look at data like that so Let's start with some spaceborne examples, and this is based on a presentation from um, Heta Lampin and Jess Stromberg from CSIRO during FEM conference in 2023. So I just want to say thank you for that. So I added some slides here and yeah, added some information to to those slides. Um, but yeah, spaceborne we have a couple of different hyperspectral instruments um, or instruments that are relevant for the spectral geology space. Um, which is Aster because it is active in the shortwave infrared between yeah 2100 and 2400 so that's where we are we really need that information to resolve in that case the cadenite spectrum for example um, but most of our mineral information sits in that wavelength range so Aster even though it's multispectral could be interesting for us and is often used still for exploration even though it was discontinued I think in 2016 um, but yeah don't pin me down on that date um, Worldview 3 is multispectral. Um, you've seen that in a couple of slides earlier. It's not on this graph, but it's very close to the ASTA um, spectral resolution and has channels in the V near N sphere. Prisma, Hisui, and NMAP are the ones that are most likely available to you in data sets. And I forgot um, Gaofen 5 here, which is the Chinese satellite, but I think I have it on the other slides. Um, so PRISMA was launched in 2019 and is from the Italian Space Agency. It's supposed to be running until 2024. It has a 30 kilometer swath. I'm not going to read all of this. Um, it's just supposed to give you some uh, information on the general um, resolution and spectral resolution for all of these. You can just pause the presentation and then look at those slides. But yeah, we have pixel sizes of 30 meters um, and a panchromatic band at 5 meter pixels. We look at 400 to 2,500 nanometers in a hyperspectral, um, yeah, in a hyperspectral instrument, and approximately 29 days repeat time. Um, and licenses are limited, so you can apply for imagery from Prisma um, for research projects. You have to apply specifically to get that data, um, unless you're located um, as a company in Italy, then you can also request access to the data. Otherwise, it's um, limited to research. There's no commercial licenses. Then Hisui um, is from the Japanese Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry and the Japanese Space Agency also launched in 2019. Um, and the data policy is very much under consideration. So um, it's not clear if and who will have access to that data. But it's it's likely that at some point, some of it will be available. Um, yeah, and we're looking at the same wavelength range, 400 to 2,500 nanometers with 10 to 12.5 nanometer spectral resolution. There are a couple of papers that say that everything below 15 nanometers sphere resolution will still give us information on the white mica and um, kaolin group cover on surfaces, but there is a debate about it. So 12.5 nanometer is um, could just be enough to actually collect the information that we need for very narrow bands or double features in the shortwave infrared. Um, but yeah, um, because they have lower spec spectral resolution um, and yeah, 30 meter spatial resolution, they have quite a good signal to noise ratio in that case just because there yeah there's always a payoff between all three um, then nmap was launched from the german space agency in 2021 and is supposed to be alive until 2026 also a push broom imager um, it collects in 6.5 to 10 nanometers in the venia and sphere so we uh, likely have a little bit less snr in those spectral channels but um, yeah we have a higher resolution for fine, um, yeah, for smaller spectral features. And we're also looking at 30 meter pixels here. 
and nmap is um, easier to understand in terms of data accessibility. The data from nmap is going to be freely accessible to everyone. Um, at the moment, uh, at the time of <laughs> recording, which is um, March 2024, we have category one users, which is a non-commercial user for scientific projects that can request access to archive data. Um, and they can also put in a proposal for a project and task data. Um, the commercial user license category two um, is supposed to be made available in 2024 so that non scientific users also have access to the archive data. Um, then we have the Pixel constellation was announced recently. Um, they have two satellites in the constellation already, uh, which are technology demonstrators. Um, and another one is supposed to be launched in 2024, 2025, which uh, is a constellation of 24 commercial hyperspectral imaging satellites that are supposed to provide 24 hour revisit periods. Um, they supposedly have 300 spectra bands and a spatial resolution of five meters. As I said, there's always a payoff between spectral resolution, spatial resolution and signal to noise ratio. So it's very likely that the signal to noise ratio in this case is not very good unless they made extreme advances in hyperspectral sensors and cameras and optical design. And that's not my forte, so I'm not saying that's not true. Um, but I'm skeptic until I um, see otherwise. And they haven't really released a lot of information on that constellation or the instruments that they're planning to put up there. So it's really hard to say. But it's a good example of hyperspectral coming, becoming more and more um, mainstream. So it seems like the need for um, yeah, Earth's surface um, mapping, classification, monitoring with a higher resolution, both spectrally and spatially. Um, there seems to be value in yeah, launching, a, launching a fleet like that. Um, and then the last satellite, so Gaofin 5 is not here, but the last satellite that I'm um, looking at is Worldview 3, which is um, the, a super spectral or multispectral high resolution commercial satellite. So commercial licenses are a little bit different here. So um, unless you are based in a country where you can apply for free data from Worldview, and that's the case for European countries, if you're a researcher in um, yeah, European countries or EU countries or even Schengen, I think um, you can apply for data from the European Space Agency. Um, apart from that, you'll have to purchase that data. Um, and we have 3.7 meters in the short wave infrared and one point, around 1.2 in the... Um, visible to near infrared. It's a really high spatial resolution, but only eight bands in the sphere and B near each. Um, then we have a couple of different airborne examples and I just put them out here for the main ones. So just so you're familiar with some of the names and what kind of instruments are being used. So we have the HiMap um, data from High Vista Corporation. We have SEBAS from the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, we have Kazi, Zazi, Mazi, etc. from ITRIS um, in different wavelength ranges. Um, then HiSpecs also provides the Mjolnir instruments that can be used for airborne UAV and ground, but um, also the classic instruments that can be mounted on a, an aircraft. Um, so yeah, those are visible to me in short wave infrared as well. Um, then Speckham has the ISA, uh, Phoenix and OWL, though I think the airborne ones are going to be discontinued in the future. Um, and then more from yeah other competitors like Etris and Headwall as a uh, hyperspectral um, imaging company. They also have UAV and ground-based cameras that can be used, the hyperspec cameras, as well as Senop. Um, and I'm not going to go too much into detail to all of them. Um, you can just easily Google them. I think the ones that you'll see most often in publications for airborne data is a virus and high map, just because they collect a lot of data um, and make those data available via different online platforms. So for exploration, for example, we have, um, we use aircrafts or um, airborne data for um, yeah, accessing inaccessible or steep terrain. Um, the difference between the uh, uncrewed aircraft 
Um, and then actual crewed aircraft is the area that can be covered. So airborne data um, in a crewed aircraft is going to be collected at a um, higher altitude and will be covering a larger area um, within a shorter time. UAS um, cover around five hectares per flight. And you can do, I don't know, five to 10 flights per day, depending on the atmospheric conditions and the sun conditions and the season and where in the world you are and um, how far you're away from the equator and all of that. So, but we're looking at a lot smaller area that can be collected with UAS. So that's usually used for specific areas that need to be monitored at a higher frequency. Um, so flying with UAV is a lot cheaper than um, renting an aircraft, for example. And um, if you need a higher resolution on the ground to see smaller patterns, then UAV or UAS would be your choice, probably. Um, yeah, so airborne has been used a lot for mineral exploration to enable targeted drilling and field campaigns and to enhance models, including geophysical and magnetic surveys. Um, so yeah, there have been a couple of studies that proved that how much that can improve predictions, even if you're scanning cover and mineralization is undercover. Um, it has shown that there is, yeah, can be reduced drilling and sampling efforts and that saves you a lot of money. Um, a virus is an acronym for Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer. So this one's collecting uh, data in 224 conti contiguous spectral bands, um, also in the visible, t visible near and shortwave infrared, so 400 to 2500 nanometers. And this one has been flown on four different aircraft platforms and is still flown. And we look at around five meter pixel resolution. I suggest you just follow that link if you want to know more about the instrument itself. But a virus is coming up in a lot of publications when you're looking into airborne hyperspectral. Then HiMap um, is built by Integrated Spectronics Inc. of Sydney. It has four different spectrometers that cover the same wavelength range around 450 to 2500 nanometers. And it says 2450 here um, because the last 50 nanometers are usually very noisy in the detector, so that's more um, realistic actually. Um, and in this case, HiMap ex already excludes two major absor atmospheric absorption windows of water, so it does not collect within a larger window around 1400 and 1900 nanometers. Um, it doesn't have constant bandwidth across the whole wavelength range, but it's between 15 to 18 nanometers. Um, yeah, and the rest I'm just going to leave here for you to, to read and look up. But high map data is also something you will come in contact with if you're looking for hyperspectral exploration publications, for example. Um, and then we have the ground-based, is often called ground-based in different publications, but yeah, ground-based hyperspectral imaging. Um, which can be a camera mounted on a truck or it can be a camera mounted on a tripod or on a semi-permanent position um, together with a lighter or any different, um, any kind of um, mount or position where you actually need to survey um, a larger area and a, a yeah, nearly vertical area. So it's often used and often published on for mind face scanning or open pit scanning from the other side of the pit to actually map the the wall across um, from the camera. Um, it can enable selective mining depending on the mine by showing different um, mineral patterns that I can tell you about penalty minerals and um, where you would want to mine material and which material would need to go through a higher processing or would go to waste stream, for example. Um, and just as any other Hyperspectral. I mean, all of the points here are true for the other methods as well, but it's more often discussed because the scale um, is a bit more relevant for yeah, characterizing contaminants. Um, mapping mine faces, especially in operational mining, hasn't been done that much, but the idea is to map mine faces while they're being extracted so that you get a cut through your deposit and mineralization with each new um, yeah, time time frame that you're actually scanning in. Um, so it can help you with yeah, identifying acid consuming minerals or penalty minerals or um, make sure that you're doing a more proactive resource handling with the mine waste that you are extracting and then um, yeah, storing somewhere. Um, I just wanted to give you an example from high specs because I've been working a lot with high specs. 
cameras, um, not so much with Speckham and Headwall, but I just want to name them here for having a having a complete um, slide in that case. But we can see here on the on the slide is the high specs Vini and Sphere camera in red and blue, and some work from my um, PhD thesis that's also open source and public, so you can find that if you Google my name. Um, it should come up. But yeah, the, again, the idea is to map mine faces, and we have a mine face here in the Republic of Cyprus in a Pliki mine, and then we have a mine face in a um, pegmatite mine in Portugal, where they were interested in lithium-bearing pegmatites. Um, you can see them a little bit in the background here, that we have something coming up that seems to be distinguishable. So often um, this is used for mineral classification or pattern um, recognition leading to mineral classification. Um, then we have different belt scanners, and I make a difference here between belt and core scanner. Belt scanner is more for a sorting perspective, so that we're actually scanning material on a conveyor belt, um, coming from a crusher, going to a crusher, something like that. Um, that can either help with um, sampling, or it can help with proactive adjustment for the mineral processing. It can help figuring out particle size variation, gang material, penalty minerals again. Um, it can help for final product control, so it could be a product conveyor um, that goes to stockpiles. All of that is thinkable um, if the material that you're scanning is actually relevant and spectrally active. And there's a couple of different um, commercial sorters out there already that use the near-infrared. So with a near-infrared, they usually mean up to 2,500 nanometers. It differs a little bit. So there are... Um, different sorting machines from Redwave, Red Wave, Tomra, Steiner, Binder & Co, and Mogensen used. So um, I just named them here. Have a look at their websites. That's going to give you a really good idea of how the cameras are integrated over and in machines like that and what kind of use cases they're, they're using them for. Because so far, scanning or using hyperspectral for sorting um, and sorters in mining in general are more of an entry-level um, yeah, industry, entry level, whatever. Um, so they are not necessarily deployed um, as a standard yet, but it seems like a, a, an easier use case and um, I feel like it's coming. Um, and there's different, yeah, um, detectors that are being used for that. We, we at Highspecs have a Baldur series, which is um, adjusted for faster scanning speeds. And then um, some of these companies, they also use um, point spectrometers or handheld point spectrometers, not handheld, they use point spectrometers. So they're not um, collecting an image, they're just collecting either a grid of points or just one point to yeah get to um, grading, for example. Uh, and Spectraflow on their website, they have a lot of good use cases and client cases that they've published that are accessible and give you a good idea. And I just wanted to put some core scanning solutions here. There's different core scanners that use imaging spectrometers and there's different ones that use point spectrometers. And um, yeah, they're being used in different, yeah, different capacities. And then last but not least, the, our handheld point spectrometers, um, which scan in or which collect data per point in the same wavelength region, uh, usually they have a much higher um, spectrosampling, like a higher resolution spectrosampling, just because, again, we have that 
we have that payoff between um, spatial and spectral spectral and signal to, spatial and spectral resolution and signal to noise ratio if we're just collecting within one pixel and that pixel in, in that case is collecting over a field of view of one to two centimeters um, we have a much higher signal to noise ratio and that means we can also adjust the um, spectral resolution by having a much um, yeah finer spectral resolution and a couple of I just put a couple of different um, examples here that, that are not all of the examples that are out there there's a couple of different ones and they all have their advantages and disadvantages and um, those instruments are used quite a lot in field work for validation so that you're um, validating for satellite campaigns for example taking um, taking spectra on the ground and analyzing them at a higher resolution um, or even for yeah core scanning or um, essay scanning and then those can be analyzed by um, different standard commercial software, which would, for example, be the Spectral Geologist, TSG, or ASIRIS. Um, and then I'm just going to leave you with these slides, which is um, data formats that you will come across, which is raw, red, radiance, and ref reflectance. Um, all of these describe different stages or types of data in processing and interpretation. Um, the raw hyperspectral data refers to the unprocessed data, which is collected in digital numbers or counts, and that still needs to be um, corrected for, um, at least for the, um, at least for the background that is being introduced into the spectrum by the camera. So often, radiance refers to the amount of electromagnetic radiation emitted or reflected from a surface at each wavelength, and it's corrected for the um, surface properties, atmospheric effects, and sensor characteristics. So yeah, usually radiance is obtained by calibrating the raw sensor data to known radiometric standards, and that could be yeah, known noise that the camera is introducing to your spectrum, for example. So sensor response and atmospheric effects would be another one. And then reflectance or at surface reflectance that can be absolute or relative is usually um, the actual intensity of incident light at each wavelength for the surface. And that means that, yeah, you act actively has or effectively, effectively have to remove the effects of varying illumination conditions. Um, and that's often done by using calibrated standards, white or gray reference standards, or by... Um, assuming or calculating the effects of the atmosphere or scanning conditions on your spectrum and removing those. So what we are looking at in the spectra that I showed you in the slide deck, those were all reflectance. You can see the difference here. This is um, just, I think it's a natural spectrum. I'm not sure. Uh, no, sorry, chloride, most likely. Anyway, but we see the difference between um, raw data to its left, radiance data towards the middle, and then, uh, and radiance is here in that case, this is high specs data, it's been corrected for um, the sensor introduced noise or sensor introduced um, effects on the spectrum. And then we have the reflectance spectrum, which is corrected using a um, white reference, calibrated white reference surface to correct for. So we see a mineral inherent uh, information in the spectrum now here in the uh, longer wavelength ranges. Yeah, and then we have um, two links from Tron from HiSpecs where he goes into key quality parameters of hyperspectral imaging cameras. So I can recommend these two articles on LinkedIn. And um, if you're interested in joining FEM Spectral, um, yeah, find us on LinkedIn or if you have any more questions, find me as well. Um, I'm usually very happy to answer questions and yeah get more people interested in hyperspectral.